All right, well, good morning. It is, a, it is interesting about Father's Day. I, I was reading a thing recently that uh, said that Hallmark, the card people, they, they have a survey. The most popular card day is Christmas. The second most popular day is Mother's Day. Father's Day is number 20. <laughs> which means God comes first, mother comes second, and dad is somewhere down in the back. And the thing that got me was number 13 was Halloween, which means ghosts and goblins are ahead of daddy. Yep, and 13 is a bad number. So, you know, congratulations, dad. You got your day. You just don't count for much. It's good to have the opportunity to fellowship, though. I, I do appreciate that. By the way, we, we, we do have a summer conference for the family. There's some information over here about it. It's July the 16th through the 21st. It'd be in a suburb of Chicago, Elk Grove Village. We are actually meeting in a Holiday Inn Express like this, except it's a, we have a bigger room and things. It's a bigger facility, conference center. But we uh, invite you to come if you have y your family. We have a program starts on Saturday night, goes to the next Thursday night, and there's a program for the whole family, children uh, from, from the nursery up through high school and the adults, and we'll keep them busy for the whole time. Uh, we've got like 20-something preachers that preach. Uh, e each day we have meetings in the morning and the evening, afternoon activities and so forth. It's a great time. I tell people, well, if you're going to take a vacation, at least take a vacation with an eternal purpose. You know, you can go see things, and you can take pictures and snapshots, and Yule Givens used to say, how many of you know who Yule Givens used to be? See, a, a, a few of you, you old timers. But he was the nature guy years ago, and he used to say, take only snapshots and leave only footprints. Don't go trashing the, 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 the outdoors. But uh, if you have an eternal a vacation with an eternal purpose where you can have, have your children and young people and your families where, where, uh, where among the saints and learn to, and meet the saints. Two of my children met their life mates at, uh, at Bible conferences. And uh, we have that all the time. And that's a wonderful thing. So if you have young people, get them involved in those kind of things. And it's good for you too if you're an old dude and you know, have something to do. So Bible conferences are very special things. And a weekend like this is great, refreshing. A whole week is a good vacation for you, so we recommend that to you. And we do it in the middle of July and every year. So we've only missed one year, and that was because of COVID. And uh, so we, we, we have that. On the table over here, there are some, some things. Any of, those, any, of the, any of our material, the, the uh, audio video, video material, all that material is available on the internet for free. If you go to our website, graceimpact.org, and you look at the media, all that's there. There's stuff, there's thousands of hours of you on YouTube and stuff that we didn't put there, but it's there. Uh, somebody sent me a note this morning, there's one of our TV programs that we're using and so forth. And that's great, I'm, I'm, that's what they're there for. But if you want, the, uh, you know, if you want it in a, in, a, in, a, in a media form, a hard form, then they're there. We have to buy that stuff, so you have to pay for it. But uh, there's some books there. If you're not on our mailing list, the mailing list is there. If you don't get, there's a current issue of the Grace Journal is there, you can see. And if you're not on our mailing list, we invite you to be on it. It doesn't cost you anything, but uh, you, you keep, kind of keep you up in, in touch with what we're doing. And you'll see information about other people and so forth. You've seen information about this conference and things. So that's there. And uh, we'll be taking that home with us if you don't want to have it. So praise the Lord. And uh, Second Timothy chapter 3. Nice to see all of your smiling faces this morning. I was on. I I, I was checking our, our ministry in Chicago. I, I was looking. I always, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will play. So you always want to know what's going on at home. Make sure everything's going okay. So I was watching the the video, the the live stream a minute ago, and my wife's sitting there looking at it, and she said, "What's that sitting on the plat?" There's the audit. There's the platform. They're trying to get ready. There's there's something sitting in front of one of the chairs. I don't know what it was. It looked like some something left over from somebody doing something. And Kyle's going to teach this morning the first session. So he sits in the chair, and then he pushes it under the chair. <laughs> 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 and 
And I thought, you know, somebody's going to get him. <laughs> so my wife will get him when she gets home. But uh, so, you, you, you know, you, get, you like to see what's going on and when, when you're not there. Make sure everything's in place. So we're glad you're here today. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, our text is verse number 14. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to fellowship around your word. We just pray that things we, we look here now in this last session might take the importance of what we've been discuss, discussing here and impress it on our hearts so that when we leave here, the truth of it goes with us in our life. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Verse number 12, uh, after verse 10 and 11, he says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So the perilous times are going to come, and if you're a believer, you're going to experience some of that. But, verse 14, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. The idea there is, in view of the perilous times, in view of the, the, the fact that the, if, you, if verse 12 it says, Yea, all they that will live godly in Christ Jesus. It's not just talking about people that do. If you have a heart for this, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be a, a culture that you live in that isn't going to appreciate what you do. You and I, if you're my age, and most of you aren't, but if you are, you've lived through a number of different things. My dad used to say, I lived in the most, the most exciting uh, century in human history. He said, I remember seeing the first automobile, horses and buggies before that. I remember seeing the first automobile, a man in our community in, in, where he lived in, in, in rural Alabama. He said, the, a, a rich man bought a car, drove it into town. We all just marveled at this, at this new invention. He said, I remember seeing the first telephone that was, was there, and then, then the, the, the television, and various things, and then, then he wound up seeing a man on the moon. <laughs> and, you know, it was just, you go from horse and buggy and nothing to all of these things. You and I lived through the technology of the last 15, 20 years, and, and you know, you, you take your cell phone now, and what a computer used to do, that cell phone now does. And it, it's not a phone, it's a computer that you carry around with you. And the, the world goes, well, in the Christian if you go back in the 1950s and 60s and even in the early 70s, but especially the, uh, until about 1960, in the 60s, it was, it was a commendable thing to be a believer. It was commendable in the culture to be a Christian. It was commendable to be a, be a preacher. It was a, people admired that. They appreciated it. In the 70s, it kind, it kind of began to shift. And it was, it was okay, but it was not something really special. You get into the 80s and people just kind of, well, it's okay, but it's, it's, it, we, it, it, the, the culture became kind of neutral about it, no longer positive and, you know, about it, but just, it's okay kind of thing. You get toward the end of the 80s, and, and, and it, it's now, well, we'll put up with you. It's okay you are, but just keep, be, be quiet and sit down over there. When you got in the 21st century, now it's not be, sit down and be quiet. It's we're not really sure we want you at the table. And now in the last few years, it's, we don't want you here. Get out. Shut up. Don't talk. There's a whole transition. And if you have a heart to live for the Lord, there's going to be problems in your life. You've heard Greg talking here about teaching. He's a public school teacher. And things that, you know, he does things and dares to do not know what the repercussions will be. And we're in Kentucky, folks. If it's going to happen anywhere, you would think it wouldn't happen here. But it does. Because the powers that be have got control of the levers of, culture, of our culture. And you, you look at all the there's perilous times, difficult times. So what do you do? Do you run for the hills? <laughs> do you hide? Verse 14, but the, what you're to do is continue thou in the things which you've learned. Just keep on being who you are. Listen, he said, don't quit. There's a saying, it's too soon to quit. Quitting isn't our responsibility. Continuing on. Keep on keeping on. Don't stop. You know the things, that you, you, you know the doctrine, you know the manner, you've got all the example. Now continue in the things which thou hast learned. Your Christian life will not operate on the basis of ignorance. You have to have an understanding of what God is doing today. Not your religion, not your church, not your denomination, but what, what's God doing? And as you've learned what God's doing and the reaction and so forth of the culture around it, continue in that, 
Everything has to be based on the truth of God's Word. That's why he said, you fully known, Timothy, my doctrine and everything that flows out of my doctrine in life. And you've seen it, and you, the things that you've seen, heard, do those things. Because that's where the Christian life operates. The things which thou hast learned and has been assured of. You didn't just learn them. You know for sure this is God's truth. Now, how do you know that? Verse 14, verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. The reason you're assured of the things that you've learned from Paul is right and, 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 and you can put your confidence in it is because it came out of the book. Verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect. What does that mean? Thoroughly furnished unto every good works. Everything you need to do, everything God wants done is in that book. And when you've learned the scripture, you can have assurance that you have the truth of God and you know what's going on. Now, if you look at verse 14 again, but continue on the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Who did he learn them from? From Paul. You've known my doctrine. That's the issue of how do you understand the scripture so that you know for sure you're doing what God wants you to do. Look back at chapter 2, verse number 7. Consider what I say. And if you consider what Paul says, what happens? And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So where is understanding going to come from? Considering what Paul says. Now what that's talking about, if you look down at verse 15, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study. How do you learn? Study. You know, you go to church today and Ted is talking about a young lady in their group that wanted to be a Christian singer. And she actually moved to Nashville and got in the Christian singing community and stuff. And you know what she found out? She found out that it's just as corrupt as the music industry in the world is. Yeah. You know why? Because it is. Because it's just a different form of the same thing. What is called, it used to be called contemporary Christian music. You ever heard that term? Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. That term was developed for a style of music in the 1980s. And if you understand music, you understand... They took, do you know what Kentucky bluegrass music is? Bill Monroe, those guys, he invented that. It's not called bluegrass music because of the Kentucky bluegrass. What he did is he took Kentucky folk music and he added a, the blue note to it. You know what a blue, brother here from New Orleans, you know what a blue note is? That's a, that's, that's, that's a ninth out of jazz. There's a construction, it's like a, the, the music language, and he took that blue note out of jazz and he put it into Kentucky hillbilly music and he literally created a new genre of music. It's a new style, it's a new language in music. That's why he's so popular. He's credited with establishing Kentucky bluegrass because he rewrote, imported. Music has, has struck... Contemporary music, contemporary Christian music, they did that. They literally restructured the way music is written. Now, we're singing these hymns, and somebody talked about a lot of those words have been altered. I know the people that did that, and they were trying to make it better. Some of those songs, they, they, they didn't make it better. That one, anyway, I'll talk about it. But two, two things about it. One, when you write... Here's a, here's, a, here's a tune, and a, a, music, a, a hymn has meter to it. Have you ever sang Amazing Grace to the song? Did, did you, have you ever sang Amazing Grace to the tune of Gilligan's Island? <laughs> Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You know why you can do that? Because the meter to that, that Gilligan's Island theme song, the, the meter is the same as the meter of the poem Amazing Grace. And you, what you do is you, you take the meter, you probably will not, you know the song, uh, Oh, How I Love Jesus? You can sing Amazing Grace to that. That's a, that's a more sanctified way of singing it. But my kids, when they were going to school, they came home from a, a, a 
session at Bob Jones University singing Amazing Grace to the tune of Gilligan's Island. So since I did it at Bob Jones, I'm thinking it's sanctified. But when you do it, so when you change words, you have, to, you have to have the right meter to the music, which is difficult. But then you want to have the right doctrine, too. And you don't want to take, you don't want to take one verse in a hymn that's using some kingdom doctrine and then put in it words from Paul's epistles that are wrong, <laughs> that, that are wrongly applied. And I and say, so, well, so it gets to be more complicated than just, I'm going to clean it up, put a verse that come out of, a lot more to it than that. Music is more complicated than that. Contemporary Christian music, and this has got nothing to do with what I'm preaching about. This is, a, this is my, my wife's going, come on, get the rabbit trail over. <laughs> Contemporary Christian music is, is restructured music. It isn't contemporary anymore. 1980 is a contemporary. We're in, the 20, we're in 2022. <laughs> but Hillsong music, Bethel music, that kind of stuff, that stuff is just, uh, it's just taking the world and putting it with some Christian lyrics. That's all that is. And that's why, that's why the corruption of the world comes in and corrupts the music. And it, it, it's not an advance, it's a, it's a retreat from, from, from truth. That's got nothing to do with what I'm a preacher about. I just thought, thought, I'd, I thought I'd throw that in for you. What was I talking about? How in the world did I get into that? No idea, right? Stu oh, study. There you go. Thank you. Music, studying isn't singing music. Studying is getting in the book. You learn by studying. Now, by the way, when we sing a hymn, some of those hymns have been sung. Do you, you know the song, uh, And Can It Be That Thou Should? That song was written by John Wesley's brother in the 1700s. That's 400 years ago. A mighty fortress is our God. You know that? Martin Luther wrote that 500 years. Saints have been singing those songs for hundreds of years. That's amazing. That some of these songs we sang here have been sang over 100 years. It's, it, it, it gives you a connection with your, your, your heritage by singing these things. Learning. Music is designed, Colossians 3, 16, to help you enhance what you know out of the Scripture. But you've got to learn the Scripture first. So learning comes from studying. So how should you study the Bible? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Why am I going to study? I want to do what God's doing. A workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that phrase in 2 Timothy 2.15 about rightly dividing the word of truth, it describes what we call dispensational Bible study. Verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings. Anything that isn't the word rightly divided is vain, empty. It's not going to help you. And it's, it's a profane, it's a worldly, vain babbling. For they will increase in a more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. When you, don't, when you don't rightly divide the word of God, the word of God becomes what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. It becomes something that's dangerous because it, it corrupts truth. Now what, watch what he says about Hymenaeus and Philetus. Who concerning the truth have what? Erred. Well, how did they err? Saying that the resurrection is past. Dispensational Bible study is simply drawing a timeline, putting things on the timeline where God puts them. If you're in the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, and you say the resurrection is past, you're saying I'm in the tribulation, dispensation of grace is over, I'm over here because the rapture is past. In other words, you, you put yourself in the wrong place on the timeline. So the key to understanding God's Word is to how does God draw the timeline and where do things fit on the timeline? Come with me to Ephesians chapter number 2. The Apostle Paul tells you, God through Paul tells you to rightly divide the Scripture. My hallucination always was if God through Paul tells me here's how to study the Bible, then maybe Paul should tell me how to do it. There are a lot of books, a lot of theologians, a lot of teachers that can tell you how they would do it. I was always interested in how would Paul do it. In Ephesians chapter number 2, Paul lays out his understanding of the timeline of Scripture. Ephesians 2 verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, time past, 
You, you Gentiles, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now things change. In Christ Jesus, you some time were far off and made not by the blood of Christ. So you've got a time past, you've got a time in the Bible, Paul calls time past. And then he's got a thing, he, he says, but now. Now, we're really, we're really being scholarly and deep thinking here. Verse number 7, that in the ages to come. So now there's going to be some ages to come. Now, what have we got? Past, present, and future. What's that? That's a timeline. It doesn't take a lot of brains to get this. It just takes some common sense. Paul lays out the Bible. He says, think about this. There's a time past when certain things are true. But now things are different. In the ages to come, those things back there are going to be fulfilled. Verse number 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In time past, the way you know you're in time past is when you see God dealing with people on the basis of a distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Ted talked last night, or, or the first session, about the middle wall of partition. The middle wall of partition has to do with God, the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Circumcision separated away the nation Israel from everybody else. Time past is, when you, when you want to know, am I in time past, when God is dealing with people on the basis of that distinction, you're in time past. Okay? But now, verse 11, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far off are made nigh. When the but now comes, now everybody is down here on the same level. There's no distinction. Ages to come, those things back here are going to be fulfilled. So time passed, basic characteristic, the distinction between circumcision and uncircumcision, that's Israel and the Gentiles. When we were in Sunday, when our kids in Sunday school, we tell them how to, the nation Israel, everybody else are Gentiles. God has one nation in the earth, for the circumcision. Now, go back to verse 12, because here's where it comes, gets to be important. That at that time, time passed, you Gentiles were without Christ. When Jesus Christ came in his earthly ministry back here, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record that ministry back here. The Gentiles were without Christ. He came to the nation Israel. So when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, Gent and John, where are, where are those books in your Bible? They're in time past. Notice verse 12 again, that at that time you were without Christ. Why? Being. Here's why they were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God. God had made some covenants. He'd made some promises to the nation Israel back here. He called out Abraham, said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. God gave up the nations of the world back here, called out Abraham. This is Genesis chapter 1 through 11 back here. He gave up the nations, let them walk in their own ways, Paul says. to go there. They didn't want to retain God their knowledge. He gave them up. And he calls out one, one man, Abraham, and says, I'll make a nation of you, and I'll demonstrate to everybody else what, what, what it is to have me as your God. Made covenants, promises. He made contractual agreements with the nation of Israel. He promised Abraham to make, to make him father of kings, a great nation in the earth. He's going to accomplish his purpose with man in the earth through the nation Israel out here. And he made, made him promises of that. He warned him. He said, if, you're, if, if you don't walk in my ways, there's going, to be some, there's going to be some problems. And so there's a tribulation period in here that is to purge out the rebel out of Israel so that redeemed Israel goes into that kingdom. All that is part of prophecy. It's part of that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. It all pertains to the nation Israel. And the problem Gentiles has is that they're, 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 they're not in that. God's going to work through these people, the covenant promises and things that he had that point them to that kingdom out there. Come with me to Exodus chapter 3. 
when he brings Israel out of the he makes Israel into a nation, brings them out of Egypt in Exodus 19. They know exactly what's going on. If you look at uh, Exodus 15, they cross the Red Sea. God brings the nation Israel into existence as a nation, brings them out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea, separates them away, closes the Red Sea down, destroys Pharaoh. He's got his people on the, on, on the, 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 new, the, new, the new life, new ground side. They sing a song, the song of Moses, Exodus 15. The, the Red Sea is in chapter 14. Um, chapter 14, verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the, land, the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the, that great work which the Lord did against the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and His servants. You know the joke about that. They see the Egyptians on the, 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 the shore of, of the Red Sea. And they said, well, it's clear that the Egyptians all had dandruff. They saw the head and shoulders on the beach. I didn't say it was a good joke. I said, that's, a, that's just the joke. <laughs> Chapter 15, Moses begins to say, he, they, they sang in the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, and the horse and his rider hath, hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my salvation and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a, hab a habitation. Why did, he, why did he bring Israel out? Because he's going to prepare a place in the earth for God to live, a habitation. My father's God, and I'll exalt him. The Lord is, the, is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Come down to verse number 15. Then the, uh, 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 verse 16, Fear and dread shall fall upon them, talking about the Gentiles, and by the greatness of thine arm they shall be still as the, as the stone, Till the, the people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them, that is Israel, in and plant them, watch carefully, into the mountain of thine inheritance. In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. They know that God created that nation in order to provide a vehicle for him to live and, and function on planet earth. Chapter number 19. Moses, talking to the nation Israel, verse number thir three. Moses said unto God, went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt, the Lord, thus shalt thou say to the house of Ju J Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. He's not talking to Gentiles, he's talking to the nation Israel. You have seen what the Lord did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. I brought you out, separated you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you should be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. That's why I drew the line above them, because he's going to make them the head of the nations. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He's going to establish his kingdom in the earth through that nation that he's separated. Holy means to be set apart. That's God's purpose. Now come with me to the book of Matthew. And I'm, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff here, but I just want you to get, get what's going on here. Matthew chapter 10. They come, John the Baptist comes, and he preaches, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's time now for that thing to, to be offered to the nation. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus chooses out 12 apostles. Why does he choose 12 apostles? Hold on to Matthew 10, look at Matthew 19. Why didn't he choose seven? Why didn't he just choose one? Matthew 19, verse 20, 28. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory. Now when's that going to be? Chapter 25, verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. 
to sit upon the throne of His glory. That's the second advent. This is the time when Jesus Christ comes back over here to take up His reign in His kingdom. The Son of Man should come in His glory, sit upon the throne of His glory. When He does that, chapter 19, verse 20, 28, When the Son of Man shall sit upon the throne of His glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The reason there are twelve apostles is because each one is going to be a prince of the nation Israel, leading the tribes. They're going to, they're going to govern the twelve tribes of Israel. So there are twelve thrones, the twelve apostles, because they are Israel's apostles over here, and he's establishing the government of his kingdom. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus says to his disciples, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What Jesus Christ is doing back here is He's gathering together the government for His future kingdom. And He's gathering out of apostate Israel. So in Matthew chapter 10, have you ever heard of what's called the Great Commission? The Great Commission was not given by Christ after His resurrection before His ascension. The Great Commission is given in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, and Acts 1, Christ, before his, He ascends into heaven, gives instructions to his, his, his disciples about particular things they're to do at particular points in the future. But the, big, the whole commission is in Matthew 10. It starts when He called unto Him His twelve disciples. He gave them power against unclean spirits, cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, now the name of the twelve apostles. See how verse 1, they're, they're disciples, now they're apostles. This is the commissioning of the twelve apostles. Their names are these, verse 2, 3, 4, He gives you the, their, their names. Verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Now watch, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you receive, freely give. So where did it go? Did it go to the nation Israel? Why? Because Israel, the Gentiles are, are, are down here being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The program up here is to redeem Israel. Why? Because it's through redeemed Israel that the nations will be redeemed. But He's going to redeem His vehicle first. This commission goes all the way, if you read down through the whole passage, you come down to verse number 20. For it, it, it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father. There's Pentecost. Now they have the Holy Spirit. John chapter 7, verse 39, He says the Holy Spirit doesn't, can't come until Christ is glorified. So the Holy Spirit comes after the Christ is glorified at the Father's right hand. He sends the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. That's verse 19. So you, you progress all the way there. Verse 23, when, you, when they shall persecute you in this city, flee into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the city of Israel until the Son of Man be come. It, this, this commission takes them all the way through to the second advent. Here's what they're to be doing, starting here, going all the way through. He talks to them about Pentecost and talks about going out through the tribulation. So this commission carries them all the way out. It starts by saying, don't go to the Gentiles. Why? Because the program in time past is that the, the blessings of God flow to the nation of Israel and through Israel. Back here, any Gentile that wanted to get to God, God's up here with Israel, had to come to Israel. He told Abraham, them that bless thee, I'll bless them, that curse thee, I'll curse. God's relationship to people in time past, it was based on their relationship to His people Israel. That's why he says in time past, you were without Christ, being aliens. The blessings, the covenants, the promises belong to the nation of Israel. And when you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what you're reading about is God's program in time past. Come with me to Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. A little lady brings her kid to Christ, wants to get her healed. Verse number 21, Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, Mark 7 says she's a Syrophoenician, she's a Syrian, came out of the coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She recognized he's the Messiah. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. 
And they went and healed the girl and brought joy to their house. See verse 23? I've seen preachers read that and it's not a problem to them. But when I read that, I said, that's a problem. He answered, said her, answered her, not a word. Now that's not the picture you get of Jesus in Sunday school normally, is it? Going around healing everybody, taking care of them. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. The little gal didn't quit. She went to his disciples. They come to Jesus and said, Would you do something for the woman? He says to them, verse 24, I'm not sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go for the program, guys. Now, you might call it what you want to, but the fact is, she was down here and they're up here. Then, then she came, watch what happens, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not meat, not proper, to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Now you think about that. That's politically incorrect today. She's a lady. And she, he calls her a dog. You know what we call female dogs? That's tough. That's Jesus talking to this Gentile woman. I can't take the children. It's not, it's not proper to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs, Gentiles. Mark says it this way. It's not meat to take the children's bread. The children must first be filled. Then you can have it. She understands that. What does she say? Truth, Lord. I know where we are, Lord. But... The dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. You know what the problem back here is? The problem is the nation of Israel. They're not being the channel of blessing God created them to be. And she says, I'm willing to get underneath Israel's, uh, in, I, I'm willing to be in the program, I'm willing to get under the table and just take the crumbs that fall off the table. The overflow of the blessing. And when he did that, Jesus said, I hadn't seen that kind of faith. I hadn't seen Israel understand the program that, much, that way. And he, he, healed the girl, he healed the kid. Why? Because she understood right where she belonged in the program. That's under the table. She belonged under submission to the program that God had. But he started off saying, no, no. The program isn't a blessing. It starts up here. I'm not a simple for the lost sheep. That's a, that's the, that's not that's not prejudice. That's not anger. That's not irresponsibility. That's understanding what the program was back there. John chapter 4, the little the Samaritan woman, Jesus says to her, you don't know, you don't got no idea what you worship. Salvation is of the Jews. You know what salvation is? It's of Israel. Now, understand, what I'm trying to show you is that that is very clear. All the dealings back here have to do with the relationship of Israel being God's people, Gentiles, the distinction between the circumcision and uncircumcision. That tells you you're in time past. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your Bible belong in time past. I talked to a preacher one time, and I asked him, I said, how much, you know, he'd been preaching 20 years. And he had, he had all of his notes in, in, in little notebooks. Some preachers do that. And I said, tell me, how many of those books are the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? <laughs> like this. How many of them are Paul's epistles? Like this. He said, I don't really understand Paul's epistles, but I love the stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> but you know what? The, that's that isn't you. That's not the way God deals with us today. We're over here the fall of Israel. The reason you try to do things that you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they don't work. And you have to push them through the knot hole to make them work. It's because they're not about what God's doing today. They're about what he's doing in time past. Now, Jesus Christ dies on the cross, ascends into heaven. Spends, well, he spends 40 days with them here. Then he ascends into heaven. In that 40-day period, come with me to Luke chapter number 24. In that 40-day period, he spent some time, he, he, he teaches them, get at Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1, 
He teaches them during that period of time in a special way. In Acts chapter number, in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, this is the night of the This is chapter starts out on the resurrection. This is the evening of the resurrection day. They're in the upper room. Luke 24, verse 44. He's eating with them. Luke 24, 44. And he, and he said unto them, These are the words which I have spoken unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, comma, beginning at Jerusalem. So now, the, now we're going to go out and take this message to all the nations. Why? Because that was God's plan, that all the nations would, would be reclaimed, how? Through the nation Israel. They're going to be His kingdom nation takes the, takes the blessing out to the nations. Where do you begin? Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. Luke is volume 1, Acts is volume 2. Of all that Jesus began to teach and to do, to do and teach, unto the day in which he was taken up, after that he, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he, had, whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Christ spent this time opening the Scriptures, teaching them, showing them in the Scripture. The reason Peter, in that period of time, can say in Acts chapter 1, he'll say, this Scripture must be fulfilled where Judas fell and has to be replaced. The reason he understood the, that Scripture was because Christ had taught it to him. He'd opened his eyes that he understood it. And they began to fulfill what the Scriptures say. Verse number 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of Him, saying, Lord, wilt thou this time begin the church of the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace? No. Will thou restore... Now watch the verse, words carefully, verse 6. Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? The only kind of kingdom ever, that Israel ever had up to that point was a literal, physical, visible, earthly Davidic kingdom. They had been carried away from that into Babylonian captivity. Are you going to restore again? They didn't have a spiritual, moral, righteous kingdom. They had a literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom. And they're looking for that literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom to be restored. Now, what preachers tell you is, well, it didn't come, so they must have misunderstood. I'm telling you, no, they understood exactly what Christ taught them. The reason it didn't come is because God interrupted that program. Verse number 7, he says, It's not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father's put in His own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come on you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. So when they, on Pentecost, when they go out, the Spirit of God comes on them, they're going to be witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. Jerusalem is the capital city. It's the city of the great king. Matthew 5, 35, don't, don't, curse, don't, don't swear by Jerusalem. It's the city of the great king. The capital city. Judea, that's, that's the southern kingdom. Israel, the northern kingdom. That's all of that's. He told him, Matthew, we read the verse, Matthew, you won't have gone over the cities of Israel, the Son of Man be come. They go over that, Son of Man comes. Psalm 2 says, when he comes, I'll give you the earth, the nations as a possession. When he says, the uttermost parts of the earth is a possession, he's quoting Psalm chapter 2. He knows exactly what the prophetic program is. The preachers tell you, Jerusalem is your hometown. Because they don't know what they're talking about. They don't believe the text. Jerusalem is your hometown. Judea is the territory around. You've, you've heard that. I just, I just read it. The largest Protestant denomination in the world, Southern Baptist, meeting out in California right now. They just had a guy preach. we got to go to our Jerusalem. They're just a bunch of lying nuts. Now, I say that reverently and discreetly and 
respectfully, but they're nuts. Read the, read the, I mean, read the text. Verse 9, when he had thus spoken these things, they beheld he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And when they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of what? Galilee. Galilee. You know where Galilee is? It's up north. Jerusalem's down south. Every man standing there was from up north. None of them were from Jerusalem. wasn't the hometown of anybody there. When some people said, Jerusalem, that was the, not their hometown. Where'd you get that from? You sucked that out of your, th your thumb. That's where that came from. You know why? Because you, you got no idea what's going on here. Because what's going on here doesn't comport with what you think ought to be going on. But when you just leave it where it is, you're in time past. The program is, we're trying to redeem Israel so they can be God's kingdom people. Time past, when God deals with people on the basis of that distinction, you're still in time past in Acts 1. Look at chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes. Verse 14, 2, 14. Peter speaking, his spirit gave him utterance. Stand, Peter standing up with eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all that ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be it known unto you, and hearken to my words. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Who's he talking to? If I sat here in this room and I said, Everybody from Chicago, listen to me. Those two people right there, listen, everybody else can just listen to what I say to them. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Peter's talking to the nation of Israel. They're at Pentecost. He's not talking to everybody. He's talking to Israel because that's what the program is. And what he's talking about, verse 16, this is that, the coming Holy Spirit, which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Joel, back here, Joel chapter 2, he prophesied about that event. Peter says, this what's happened here is what Joel prophesied. Now Peter speaking by the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing. He knew what he wrote in Joel. And he knew what he was doing over there. And the God the Holy Spirit through Peter says, this is that which Joel prophesied. Look at chapter 3. Verse 19. Again, Peter's talking, and he's talking to Israel. It's on the porch of the, of the temple. Repent you therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he says, in Jesus Christ, which before is preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of refreshing, uh, uh, times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Everything that God has been prophesying since the world began is beginning to be fulfilled, according to Pete. Now, if you come all the way over to chapter, chapter 11, verse 19, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, that's back in Acts 8, traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to who? That's time past. The reason the things that go on on the day of Pentecost don't work today, the reason there's confusion today based upon things going on the day of Pentecost is because that's not us. And when you try to make yourself be somebody you're not, it never works. Why were the talking in tongues on the day of Pentecost? If you go back to the last, the last couple of verses in, in Zechariah chapter number 8, it talks about this kingdom. They come back. It says, in that kingdom, ten men out of all the languages of the nations will come and take the hold of the skirt of him that's called a Jew and say, we'll go with you because we've heard God's with you. I don't know about you, but I speak two languages. I speak English and I speak Southern. <laughs> and beyond that, I don't got much else. I'm really working on English. 
We moved to Chicago. I spent two years up there preaching, not knowing why people were laughing at me. I, didn't, I wouldn't tell them jokes. I don't, I don't try to tell jokes. I just am a joke sometimes. A lady in the church, she taught English in the, in the government school there for 50 years. She said, sit down here, Richard. I want to talk to you. Okay. And she pulled out a notebook. She had two pages. She said, here's things you say. I got no idea what they mean. <laughs> what in the world does tie a rag on the bush mean? Now, every one of you understand that. How do you explain that to somebody that speaks proper English and doesn't understand, you know, that kind of uh, metaphor? And so I try to explain, what does a bump on a dill pickle mean? I mean, she, she went through all these things that I wasn't even aware I was saying, but that I, you know, I say those things. Like I said, I speak Southern. <laughs> and I've learned to speak a little more proper English. Israel's going to go out and preach all these nations. They've got all these different languages. They're going to need a miraculously empowered linguistic ability to communicate to ten languages at one time. One guy, ten languages. That's what the, what's happening here is a reversal of what caused this back in Genesis 11. What was it? The Tower of Babel. What did he do? He scattered the languages to scatter the nations. He's going to give them the capacity supernaturally to reunite today. So there's something going but you got people thinking they're worshiping God. You know what it is? It's a bunch of pagan nonsense. Now you say that, and people say, oh! I'm just saying, in your Bible, that's time past. If you can get up beyond the emotion of that, the shock of that, and see that, you'll have an answer to confusion that you'll never find any other way. And all the attempts to explain it away, it didn't re it didn't real, that kind of stuff. No, it isn't what God's doing today. So God isn't doing it today. Well, when, when did things change to here? Look at Romans chapter 11. We've been looking at Romans 11 some this week, talking about verse 13. Ted went over that our first evening. But start back in verse 11, Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they, and he's talking about the nation Israel here, stumble that they should fall. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was a stumbling block. Look back at chapter 9, the last verse. Chapter 9, verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumble at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoso believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Only one time did God put that, that stone of stumbling, that rock of offense, in Israel, lay it in Israel. That's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earthly ministry of Christ. And when they crucified him, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. But they didn't fall. God didn't throw them away. He didn't quit dealing with them. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He had told them, if you speak a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven you. But if you blast him against the Holy Ghost, you're in trouble. Because God the Father sent John and you, had him, you allowed Herod to kill him. God the Son came and you demanded Rome kill him. When God the Holy Spirit comes, there isn't any, no, no member the God had to go find mercy from. So when the Holy Spirit comes to the day of Pentecost... There was a renewed opportunity for that nation to repent. Peter says, they said, what should we? He says, repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They're going to have the sins remitted right there, going to the kingdom. That's why in Acts 2, 40, he says, save yourself. Did you know you can't save yourself? Peter said they could. Save yourself from what? Not hell, the lake of fire, from this untoward generation. Separate yourself away from that apostate nation, become part of that little flock that's going to go into the kingdom. That's all Israel's program. So they stumble, verse 11. Have they stumbled, they should fall? No. But rather, through their fault, then they do fall. So they stumble. Subsequent to that, they fall. And that fall takes place in Acts chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen. 
Look back there with me. Acts chapter 7 real quick. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Stephen is taking them through Israel's history. He's bringing them down to the conclusion. Verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Now you go back in the prophets and find, find God calling Israel uncircumcised in heart and ears. You can find that back in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. That's, they had spiritually become like these people down here. Which of the prophets have you not have have not your fathers persecuted? They have slain them which before, showed before the, the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been betrayers and murderers. Verse fifty four. When they heard these words, these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They did a Mike Tyson on him. They didn't like it. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus. Notice carefully. Doing what? Standing on the right hand of God. Now you take that verse and compare it with Acts chapter 2. Verse 34. In Acts chapter 2 verse 34, Peter, speaking by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to, to, to them, he says, But David, Acts 2 34, is not ascended into the heavens, but he him, saith himself, The Lord, this is Psalm 110 verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. He sits down up here at the right hand of the Father, and he's going to do it until, what? He makes his foes his footstool. That is, he comes back over here and sets up his kingdom. The next verse in Psalm says, Reign thou in the midst of thine enemies. Comes back set up his kingdom. He's going to stand up to do that. So in Acts 7, what position does Stephen see him in? He's not sitting anymore. Now he's standing. In the prophetic scripture, why would he stand up? To come back and pour his wrath out. See that? The moment for the beginning of the day of the Lord's wrath was right there. Why didn't it come? Where did it go? Because God interrupted the time pass program with a mystery program, with a secret program. And he literally put a parenthesis in prophecy. Let me show you. Get Romans chapter six, 16 and Acts chapter 3. Go back where we were a minute ago. Romans 16 and Acts 3. Romans 16 and Acts 3. In Acts 3.21, talking about Christ, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Spoken by all the pro prophets since the world began. That's what this is. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now who got the revelation of the mystery? Ephesians 3. We're going to know that verse over and over. How by revelation he made known to me the mystery, which in other ages was not made known, sons of men, as it's now revealed. According to the revelation of the mystery, which was what? Kept secret since the world began. This was kept secret since the world began. Listen, folks. A six-year-old kid that flunked kindergarten can get this. You can have more degrees than you got temperature and miss it. But you don't have to be that way. Something that was kept secret since the world, something that was spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began is different from something that was kept secret since the world began. This was not spoken about, not talked about, not preached about since the world began. They're two different things. And that different thing came in with the ministry that Christ had when he saved the Apostle Paul and made known to him a new revelation, a new program that had been kept secret. Had to do with the forming of the church, the body of Christ. 
to the fall of Israel. Everybody, he concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy on all. And he writes, Paul writes that stuff down in some books in the Bible, as I wrote a four and few words, wherein you understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. And he put some books in the Bible that have that. This thing's going to go out one day. He's going to come back, take us into the heavens to be with him, and he'll go back and he'll finish his program with the nation of Israel. So he wrote some books for these people over here so they'll understand what happened in light of the change of the program. That's why in 2 Peter chapter 3, when Pete talks, he says, over here, people are going to be scoffers and say, you've been saying this for thousands of years and it never, never happened. He says, you know what the, the answer for the delay the Lord's not slack concerning his promises. Men count slackness, but he's long-suffering. And the, the long-suffering is explained, 2 Peter 3.15, by the message Paul preached. So Peter says these people, the reason it's been delayed is God did something else. Explained by Paul. When that's over, this will be finished. Now think about this. Time passed. Distinction in front of Israel and the Gentile. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, time passed. Acts begins in time past, but ends in the but now. No distinction. Over here, you go back to the distinction. Who do you think Hebrews is written to? Did you ever read James chapter 1, verse 1? James, an apostle, the servant of Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Did you ever read 1 Peter and 2 Peter? To the strangers scattered abroad. I mean, it's pretty clear what's going on here. This is us. That's them. Time passed, but now. Isn't it fascinating that your Bible, your, your New Testament is laid out that way? These books weren't written in that order, but that's the edification order. The doctrine of proof correction. All you've got to do is read your Bible. Take a King James Bible and read it, and you'll get the information, the edification, if you just believe it, believe it like it is. But preachers don't tend to do that. Listen. The confusion, the, the heartache, the controversy that provokes Christianity has 2,000 years can be largely cleared up and resolved by recognizing this is us and that's them. Tongues, think about things, tongues, baptism. Think about baptism. Is there anything that divides the body of Christ more than those two things today? Paul says there's one baptism. Matthew 3, Jesus says there's three. <laughs> Matthew 3, 11, John baptized you with water. John says, I baptize you with water. He that comes after my baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's three baptisms, one verse. How come Paul says there's one? Because in that program back over here, there's about a dozen. And here, you know what happened when you got saved? The moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God the Holy Spirit did five things to you that instant. You didn't feel them, touch them, know about them. They're not experienced on a spiritual basis, and you only read them because you're reading your Bible. One of them is by one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body. When you got saved, God the Holy Spirit baptized you into Jesus Christ, into his body. It, later on, a preacher might have come along and said, I need to baptize you. That, you already got it. You already got it for one. They said, well, you need a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. That's two and three. You want to understand what, what, what it is? That's yours. And you didn't, you got it. Nobody told you you could. Nobody told you you couldn't. God did it. Think about prayer. Think about doing the will of God. Think about all these things that people struggle with. I got a, I got a, I got a, a note from. I'm just gonna read you this. This came from. From email. Just, just last week. Over the years, bit by bit, church doctrines and rules crept into my relationship with God, bringing me to a place where I felt I could never be good enough, pray enough, or read the Word enough, to truly please, be pleasing to God. I love the Lord, but felt I never was going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I hadn't gone for three years to the church I've been a member of for over 20 years for reasons I won't mention. But I saw a TV program called Forgotten Truths, mostly because 
the title intrigued me. I couldn't believe I'd missed these truths. Not just the grace of forgiveness, but the grace of living life day by day with Jesus after forgiveness. What else actually happened the moment we believed? The answer is abundant, radiant, amazing. But it took me almost 20 years after becoming a Christian to really to, to, to be ready to hear these truths of my true identity and Christ living within me. Until that moment, I really thought I could live the Christian life on my own self-effort by trying harder and working more. But devastating failure was the result. The grace message explains why self-effort fails and reveals the vastness of God's grace, His living power within, and learning to rest in it. You know what that is? That's understand who you are there. That's where the victory is, because that's who we are. Continue in the things you've learned and been assured of, knowing of whom you learned them. I said the first night, not understanding Paul's your pattern, the consequences of not understanding is devastating. You can be scriptural and completely out of the will of God. Quoting verses. If you don't rightly divide them. All the Bible's for you. All the Bible's true. But it's not all about you. And when you understand how to lay it out in God's way, then all of a sudden, these books that aren't about you become fascinating. Aren't you interested in what other people do? Aren't you as nosy as I am? And you can let them be what they are and say what they say. And you can be like this guy. You can get over the confusion of trying to be somebody you aren't. We say grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's also grace rightly applied, changes everything. Continue down the things which thou hast learned, been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And you know what you'll do? You'll have who you really are in Christ be the victory for you. It's not just to be different from everybody else, it's to understand that's who we are, complete in him. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. A spiritual body of believers is going to use in the heavenly places for the age. Listen, your hope is more than dying and going to heaven. <laughs> it's more than the rapture to get out of the troubles of this world. God has a plan and a purpose to use you to honor in the ages to come to show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. All through the heavens. He'll reconcile the earth under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ through Israel. He reconciled the heavens, the government of the heavens under the authority of Christ through the body of Christ. And he'll make all things one under one head. You've got a wonderful Savior. His grace has included you too. Just go be who he's made you. Quit trying to be somebody else. And let his will, his life, his purpose be yours. I tell people all the time, they say, Brother Rick, I need, I need to know how to do the will of God in my life. You go find out what God's doing and do that, and you'll be doing the will of God. Because the will of God's about Him, not about you. The will of God isn't about where you're going to be at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. The will of God's what God's doing. His will is that all men be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. You'll be involved in that, and you'll be doing His will. And He wants to do His will in your life. He wants His life to live in you. He doesn't want you to be like me or you, somebody else. He wants to put... Jesus, the life of Christ will purify any culture, every culture, and show you how he would live in that culture. Do the same with you. So you need to know him. And you need to let his you need to learn what he's doing, understand what he's doing, and let that be what lives in you. So thank God for that. Praise the Lord for that opportunity. And for the chance to talk to you about it. Remind you, don't quit too soon to quit being who you really are. Okay? All right. Ten minutes ago, your room got locked up. <laughs> Father, we thank you today for your love and your grace to us in Christ Jesus. It humbles our heart 
to be able to say thank you for the privilege of saying that we love you. And we know it's all because you first loved us.